Hey everyone, welcome to Sunshine Hills Church. So glad you're joining with us today. Just want to remind you of all the great things we have coming up for our kids and our students this summer. Uh, VBS in person is back at the church. Kids Camp and Youth Camp at Stillwood are back in person this summer. We're so excited for the opportunity to be able to send our kids and our teenagers um, to these things for a week to get away from the norm and to really press into all that God has for them. So we want to encourage you, if you haven't done so yet, sign your kids up for VBS. That's uh, July 18th to 21st. I believe it's $25 per kid. It's a simple online registration. Uh, and then for Youth Camp and for Kids Camp, that's at the end of August for both of those. Uh, all the links to the website to sign up are on our social medias. Uh, I want to encourage you to get your kids there. Just a reminder as well that we are encouraging us as a church to give towards camps. The cost is expensive for kids and students. So if you feel um, just the encouragement on your heart to give something to help a, a child or a teenager get to camp, we want to encourage you to write camp on your offering envelope or in your e-transfer. And uh, as a church, we want to help support our young people and get them to these important weeks away uh, with God and with others. So that's uh, the things coming up for our students and for our kids. For VBS as well, please, uh, if you're interested in signing up to volunteer, we'd love to have you be part of the team. You can talk to uh, Victoria and all the areas that are available for that. And the last announcement is we are like two weeks now out from our party in the park, our big return to that event. It's going to be held at Wade Road Park on Friday, June 24th from 6 till 9 in the evening. This is a chance for us as a church to be present in our local community, in our neighborhood, to meet people, to greet people, to tell them about our church, to enjoy an evening together, having food and playing games together. It's us hosting our community. So I want to encourage you uh, to be there, and not only to be there, but to sign up into an area to volunteer. We have a, a number of hour-long spots uh, over the course of three hours where you can help with food service. You can help uh, get supervise one of the inflatables so that kids aren't getting injured. You can help with face painting. You can help with the info desk just to greet people. Let them know what we have as a church that might be able to, of, of, um, of interest to them. Uh, so we just want to encourage you to sign up for that. Uh, if you go to our Facebook page, you'll see a, a breakdown of all the different areas where you can get involved and a Google form you can click on to sign up. Uh, come talk to myself or any of the staff members. We'd love to talk to you more about Party in the Park. And we want to encourage us as a church to be present that night in our community, to be greeting people, to be with them, to host, uh, and to have a wonderful time in our neighborhood that evening. So those are our announcements. Uh, be sure to get involved with all we have going on. And uh, I'll be back in a moment for this week's message. Are you ready? Are you excited? Church starts now. Well, good day, church. Glad you're joining with us right now. I had this, I had this funny thought this week. At least it was funny to me. Hopefully it's funny to someone else. Uh, but I was struggling with the tone of today's message. I'm not going to lie. Like last week, we're heading into heavy. We're heading into potentially uncomfortable territory. And I was struggling with the tone. And it got me thinking, because in pop culture, the genre of a TV show or a movie often dictates the tone of that particular show. I started wondering, what if sermons had genres? Like, what if I just really leaned hard into various genres when delivering a message? So, like, what if we had, like, the action-adventure sermon, right? Like, Moses and the Israelites escaping from Egypt, or uh, I love the one with Jonathan and his armor barrel. You can really just lean into the action-adventure aspect of that, right? You know, what about the romantic sermon? You know, I think of, like, the Book of Ruth or Song of Solomon. Like, really is leading into the romance of it. I was wondering, can, can you have, like, a thriller sermon? I was thinking about, like, Jesus and Satan in the desert and, like, that, that like, temptation. Like, could you frame that as, like, a, an intense thriller, a showdown between the two of them? You know, I was thinking about, like, the fantasy sermon, Revelation. <laughs> that's an easy, that's a, that's a slow pitch over the plate right there. Uh, the book of Revelation is the fantasy sermon with its crazy imagery. That was like, what about the musical sermon? What if we just like sang through the Psalms of the church together and just had like a musical, you know, experience together? Now, I'm not really sure if any of this is biblically appropriate, but it gave me a good a laugh. So I was trying to figure out uh, the tone for this morning. Uh, the idea of just leaning hard into genre as I preach was a humorous idea to me. Uh, you know, with kind of with that tagline and that deep movie voiceover trailer of, you know, coming soon to a church pulpit near you. I guess it made me laugh. Hopefully it makes someone else laugh as the kind of the ridiculousness of the idea. All of this, of course, brings us to today's message, uh, week six of our Victorious series. I know today we're looking at the second of two churches that we're facing, the significant challenge of false teaching or false teachers in their midst. And today's church is the church in Thyatira. Now, if the genre 
thing was humorous to you, you might be wondering, what is the genre of today's sermon? Well, it's kind of like the family drama that starts light, but then takes like a, a very sharp turn into the like, quite serious territory. Or the one that really hits me uh, as a child of the 80s and 90s is it's that, it's that familiar family sitcom trope. Where it's all fun and games to start the episode, but then the kids mess up, they get into trouble. And the, the, the majority of the episode is the parents going, hey, Johnny, Jenny, we need to, we need to talk about what happened. And then the entire this, uh, episode is like that family get, like, get together and sit down where like, they just really, that wasn't okay and we need to talk about what comes next. And it's like that after school special where like you, you went for the last, you came away being like, I learned something important today. Hopefully that is today's message. And remember, ultimately, the reason why we're examining each of these churches isn't for a fun history lesson. It's not for a little peek back through time into what happened back then. But each church is an archetype, a picture of what we could be or have been or even are if we're not careful to pay attention to what Jesus spoke to the original seven churches in Asia. And though it may not be one of the most well-known of the churches, Thyatira certainly has much to speak to us today as Jesus plays the role of that loving father from the sitcom trope and sits us down as his children and says, hey, we need to talk about some things. Thyatira has a lot to speak to us today. So let's pray and then we'll read the letter. Jesus, we thank you for your words. We thank you for these messages that you sent to churches thousands of years ago that still resonate and are still relevant to us today. And God, we pray as we begin to peel back the layers on this message to the church in Thyatira that we would see very clearly both the love of your heart, but the intensity of your words and your language towards us in regards to what needs to change and what we need to uh, be aware of. So I pray that you'd speak clearly today. pray that we'd hear you above all else. Would you cut through the noise and would we hear you and you alone? In the name of Jesus, amen. So we're picking up in Revelation chapter 2, starting at verse 18. And it says, To the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These are the words of the Son of God, whose eyes are like blazing fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. I know your deeds, your love and faith, your service and perseverance, and that you are now doing more than you did at first. Nevertheless, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophet. By her teaching, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and the eating of food sacrificed to idols. I have given her time to repent of her immorality, but she is unwilling. So I will cast her on a bed of suffering, and I will make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely unless they repent of their ways. I will strike her children dead. Then all the churches will know that I am he who searches hearts and minds, and I will repay each of you according to your deeds. Now I say to the rest of you in Thyatira, to you who do not hold to her teaching and have not learned Satan's so-called deep secrets, I will not impose any other burden on you except to hold on, hold on to what you have until I come. To the one who is victorious and who does my will to the end, I will give authority over the nations, that one will rule them with an iron scepter and will dash them to pieces like pottery, just as I have received authority from my Father. I will also give that one the morning star. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Okay, let's just fill in some blanks and set some context for this city. So Thyatira was founded as a military outpost, but at this point in history, it was now a center of business and trade. It was known as the, the manufacturing and marketing hub of the Roman province of Asia. It's known as a working man's town. And there's, no, there's no real historical record that Christians suffered any significant religious or political persecution here in this city. But they were caught in a dilemma. They were caught in a very specific challenge. See, Thyatira was home to many trade guilds. They were, they were actually famous for the unusually high number of trade guilds that they had. Now, that includes, are you ready for this? Wool workers, linen workers, makers of outer garments, dyers, leather workers, tanners, potters, bakers, slave dealers, bronzemiths, and shoemakers. At the very least, they had a number of these trade guilds for the manufacturing and marketing of these wares. You go, that's great. What does this mean? What it meant is this. 
You couldn't make a living in Thyatira unless you were a member of one of these guilds. If you were going into business and you wanted to strike it on your own, the sheer number of trade guilds and the monopoly that they had would have made it impossible for you to make a living. Not joining a trade guild in Thyatira was the equivalent of risking complete financial ruin. So then we go, well, okay, so just join the, join the guild. So what? Here's the thing. Membership in a trade guild required participation in the social activities of that guild. And each guild had their own patron deity chosen from either the Greek or Roman pantheon. And that deity would have figured prominently into the nature of the social activities. Apollo is one of the most common deities. Uh, he was seen as the divine guardian of that city. And much of this activity would have been similar to what we unpacked last week in regards to eating uh, meat sacrificed to idols and sexual immorality, that to engage in the activities of the trade guild, the social activities, would have been diving right back into all the stuff that we unpacked last week. So what we discover in Thyatira is a church doing a lot of things well, but also a church full of people living in compromise in order to make it in the city. And the more that we dig in, the worse that it gets. So I want to present to you this morning Thyatira, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And yes, I know that I described this message as a family drama, and I just robbed that, that title from a Western. We're going to get genre a mash now. It's going to be okay. So let's start, let's start with the good, shall we? Jesus says, I know your deeds, your love and faith, your service and perseverance, and that you are now doing more than you did at first. This is actually one of the most glowing commendations of all the seven letters. I know your deeds, your love, your faith, service, perseverance. I know your deeds. I see what you're doing. All of these things are present. And let's be honest, for a church, these four areas, love, faith, service, perseverance, these four areas are really good ones to be known for, right? Right? These are virtues to be pursued and, and made commonplace in our own lives and the life of our local church. Immediately when I read this, I hear the voice of the Spirit going, are you known for your love? Are you known for your faith? Are you known for your service? Are you known for your perseverance? And it causes me to pause and to think about that. But the most important piece of the accommodation is actually the quantifier that Jesus adds at the end. He says, you are now doing more than you did at first. In other words, there's growth here in this church. Their spiritual life has not plateaued. They are growing in love, in faith, in service, and in perseverance. Going to church has made an actual difference in the lives of the people. They are increasing in their understanding and application of what it means to be a follower of Christ. This reminds me so clearly of the words that Peter writes in the beginning of his second letter. In 2 Peter chapter 1, starting in verse 5, he begins to list off the qualities that we should be pursuing in addition to our faith. Because belief is great, belief is the foundation, but belief should also affect action and should affect character. So in, first Peter, or in, sorry, in 2 Peter, Peter says, add to your faith goodness, and to goodness add knowledge, and to knowledge add self-control, and to self-control add steadfastness, and to steadfastness add godliness, and to godliness add mutual affection, and to mutual affection add love. And then in verse 8, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 8, the root of his encouragement is revealed, or Peter says, if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And it's that phrase, increasing measure. It's the same thing that Jesus is commending the church in Thyatira for. You are doing more than you did at first in these areas. Now, hopefully, church, this isn't a new idea. That being around Jesus and being around Christians would actually affect change in your lives. I know, I know it's shocking, but hopefully it's not a new idea. We are meant to grow spiritually. This is how we become, as Peter says, effective and productive. Growth is the goal. Which brings to mind, for me, two questions for us here at Sunshine Hills. Are we offering opportunities for you to grow? And are you taking advantage of the opportunities? And I ask both because there's equal responsibility there. It would be unfair for, for any church leader to be like, oh, my, my church doesn't want to grow. Well, are you offering anything for them to actually grow with? And it would be, you know, unfair for, for, 
on the, on the flip side as well. So when I say, are we offering opportunities for you to grow? You know, when you come to church on Sunday, when you send your students to student ministry, when you attend a life group, or when you go to retreat, whatever it is, in those areas, are there actually opportunities for you to grow? And then are you taking advantage of the opportunities? When you attend, when you come to these things, are you actively responding or are you just checking the church box? I'm not trying to call anyone out or, or expose anything specifically. I'm just trying to plant the seed for us to think about. When you get in the car on Sunday morning, where's your head at? You know, as I head to church today, am I hoping for a word that will change my life? Or am I just, just going to go see some people that I want to see and, and sit in a service that's, that's okay? You know, do we take church seriously? Do we take life group and student ministry and retreats and camps seriously? Are we seizing the opportunities for change that God is placing in front of us? Pursue all that he has for you. Growth is the goal. That's what we see in this message of Thyatira, that they were in increasing measure. That is what we should be striving for, increasing measure. So that's the good. And it's commendable to the point of being an example to aspire to. But there's, there's a pesky word that keeps showing up in these messages, in these letters from Jesus to the churches. And that word is nevertheless. All the good doesn't cover up the issue or the issues that Jesus sees. Despite all the good, I do still have this against you and we need to talk about it. And in this case, he says, you tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophet. By her teaching, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and the eating of food sacrificed to idols. So like I said earlier, it's a similar concern as last week with the church in Pergamum. The people are being misled by false teachers, and the main areas of deception involve sexual immorality and food sacrifice to idols. But this isn't last week's message. And we're going to dig down even more to unearth the truth that God has for us today. So the center of corruption within the church of Thyatira, is a woman called Jezebel. We don't know if this is her actual name or just a descriptive title. You see, the name Jezebel is similar to names like, like Judas or Hitler from history. Or like even now in modern day, we use words like uh, Karen to like describe someone's attributes as opposed to their actual name. Uh, you know, even if you look to like recent world leaders, someone like Trump where that name incites a powerful association, gets the mention of it, and you have an idea of the kind of person you're talking about. It's a powerful statement to call a woman Jezebel, as the mind is instantly drawn to the Jezebel of the Old Testament, who is regarded, regarded as one of the most evil individuals on record in the Bible. So if you're not familiar, Jezebel is a committed worshiper of Baal. She had an army of prophets that were devoted to spreading her ideas and her ways. She would execute any prophet of God who dared to speak against her. She was basically the puppet master behind the scenes, manipulating and, and maneuvering the king who was Ahab at the time. She perpetuated the ideal that uh, the worship of Baal and the worship of Yahweh could happen side by side, knowing full well that was inaccurate, knowing full well that the people would have to compromise at some place. The, the name Jezebel is synonymous with compromise and sin and evil. And here in Thyatira, Jesus sees someone similar, someone who represents the spirit of Jezebel, the spirit of compromise, gaining a foothold in his church. And worse than that, Jesus says the church tolerates her. They let her remain. They don't appear to be doing anything about her. This is the bad. The church in Thyatira is tolerant of sin. They are tolerant to the spirit of compromise. They seem to think that increasing in godly virtues over here will balance out the bits of compromise they tolerate over here. So I want to talk about tolerance for a few minutes, and, and hopefully I don't get in trouble in how I unpack this. Because tolerance is all the rage in our world today. We, we are taught to be tolerant of one another to be tolerant of other ideas, to be tolerant of everything, right? And I have to pause and I ask myself, does that actually sound nice to anyone? When I think of the word tolerance, I often frame it as a negative. You know, I don't, I don't like, I don't really like my kids, I guess, I guess tolerate them. I don't really like this person, I guess tolerate them. Like, that doesn't sound 
good to me. You know, I don't, I don't like what we do at my workplace. I don't like what we do at my school. I guess, but I guess tolerate it for now. Like to me, that's a negative, and I recognize it could be, a, it could be generational. For me, that word may be negative. For others, it may be a positive. But for me, I always think of tolerance as a negative concept. But here's the thing: whether I feel it's negative or someone else frames it as positive, tolerance isn't a biblical virtue. Jesus isn't commending this church for their tolerance. He, in fact, holds it against them. Tolerance isn't a biblical virtue. Patience is. Understanding is. Civility is. Graciousness, mercy, humility, these are all biblical virtues, but not tolerance. Church, hear me very clear on this. Tolerance is a low bar. We've been called to a much higher standard. We've been called to a godly standard, to a kingdom standard. When it comes to people, I don't want to tolerate people. I want to love people. I want to communicate value and worth and acceptance. I want to communicate love, not just I tolerate you. The Church of Jesus Christ, and Daryl Johnson writes this in his book that we've been going through on the book of Revelation. He says, the Church of Jesus Christ is to be an inclusive community in the sense that all are welcome. And he pulls the language from Scripture, Jew and Gentile, free and slave, male and female. All are welcome. We we can pull that forward to the cultural issues of the day. All are welcome. All skin colors, black and white. All are welcome. All are welcome. Straight, gay, trans, all are welcome. But then he goes on to say the church is not to be inclusive of, of all ideas, of all presuppositions, of all social and spiritual persuasions. And this is where we get caught every time. Because ideas are different than people. And we have a hard time separating those two things sometimes. Jesus is for people. All are welcome. All are loved. All are accepted. All belong. Even in today's text, read carefully. What does it say about Jesus' response to Jezebel? It says, I have given her time to repent. Even to the one who has carried the spirit of Jezebel and the spirit of compromise into his church, Jesus shows patience. He shows mercy. He shows a desire for her to change, to come to her senses, and to come running into his arms. Jesus is for people. Even when the people are actively out to lead his church astray, Jesus is for people. But he's not for every idea. He's not for every presupposition. He's not for every persuasion that we hold on to. He loves the woman Jezebel, but he sure doesn't love the ideas that she's spreading and the impact that she's having. And he knows that the longer the church tolerates her, the longer they allow her to remain unchallenged, he knows two things. It will be less likely that she will actually repent and change because she's just being tolerated. She's not being challenge or questions or or engage. She's just being tolerated. It'll be less likely that she'll repent and change, and it'll be more likely that the church will compromise and be led astray. Jesus calls out the tolerance that he sees in Thyatira because he knows the road that tolerance leads down. This is where we come to the, the ugly part of it all. Jesus doesn't pull any punches in describing what comes next. He doesn't try to soften the blow or tone down the image, so I'm not going to either. He says, I've given her time to repent of her immorality, but she is unwilling. So I will cast her on a bed of suffering, and I'll make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely. Lest they repent of her ways, I will strike her children dead. Harsh, harsh language. Tolerating Jezebel meant tolerating the spirit of compromise. And compromise at the end of the day is just a nice word for spiritual adultery. The ugly part of the church is this. They are cheating on Jesus. They are sleeping around with other gods and hoping it won't catch up to them. You know, after doing, after all, they're, we're doing so well in so many key areas. They're doing, remember, they're doing better now than they were at first. A little spiritual adultery over here won't, won't harm anything, right? And Jesus calls it out clear as day. He says, no, you're, you're wrong. Spiritual adultery leads to spiritual sickness. You, you catch that? The bed of suffering, I'll cause them to suffer intensely. Spiritual adultery leads to spiritual sickness, and spiritual sickness ultimately leads to spiritual death. I will strike her children 
dead. This is the progression that Jesus spells out in his message to Thyatira. We can't dabble in compromise and spiritual adultery and hope to end up spiritually healthy. Yes, they were increasing, but there will come a point where that increase will stop if they continue to dabble over here because the progression goes from spiritual adultery to spiritual sickness to spiritual death. It's just not how it works. If you take any human relationship, the same is true. I'm not going to have a healthy relationship with my wife if I'm compromising myself with other people over here. So why do we think the opposite is true when it comes to our relationship with Jesus? You know, I love you, Jesus. I live for you, but, but I, have, I do have a few other lovers over here too. Don't worry. They're not that big of a deal. You know, I, I couldn't imagine saying those words to my wife. But we say it to Jesus all the time. And maybe we don't say it with our words, but we should certainly show it with our actions. Tolerance leads to compromise, which leads to cheating on Jesus, and then more often than not trying to justify it. Now, there's a reason why I'm pressing so hard on this one. And the reason is this. I'm afraid. I'm afraid that the state of the church in Thyatira is most likely the state that we will find ourselves or our church in. It's, a, it's the one that resonates with me the most, is the one that is so easy for us to slip into. Yeah, we're increasing in all this good stuff over here. We're growing spiritually. We're doing well as a church, but we're quietly tolerating compromise and sin over here. It's just a little. It's just a little. Don't worry. It won't cause, won't really cause any damage. You know, what are a few extra levers on the side when we're still growing uh, in so many good areas over here? But church, do we, do we really want to get caught cheating on Jesus? The consequences of those actions don't sound too pleasant according to this letter. Failure to repent and turn around leads to spiritual sickness and eventually death. And I want us to be really clear because there is a lot of nuance here. Let's note the fact that what leads to the sickness and death isn't the act itself, isn't the initial sin. It's the failure to repent and turn away. We're not perfect. We're going to mess up. We're going to make mistakes. That's why Jesus has so much grace and mercy and love and forgiveness for us. But when we fall victim to a spirit of tolerance and a spirit of compromise, we begin to fall into these traps and we fail to repent and we fail to turn away. And it's that continual failure to turn back to God, that continual failure to just get stuck in the mud of compromise that leads to sickness and eventually death. Famous pastor and theologian, Dietrich Bonhoeffer suggests this, the human heart has the capacity for only one all-encompassing, all-embracing allegiance. Does Jesus truly have our allegiance or are we cheating on him? You know, for someone like Bonhoeffer to say that, it rings so true because he lived during World War II. He lived in an era where he watched the church pledge allegiance to God and also pledge allegiance to Hitler. For the Christians in Thyatira, their allegiance was also torn between Jesus and the trade guilds. You know, they asked themselves these questions. Who will I follow? Will I follow Jesus or will I follow follow the leaders of the trade guilds? Who will be first? Will it be Jesus and his kingdom or will it be the expectations of the trade guilds? What will be of utmost importance, the success of my business, the success of my ministry, the success of my endeavors? Or the vitality of my relationship with him? What will be of utmost importance? What will take precedence over and control my everyday decisions? The values and priorities and spirit of my contemporaries? Or the values and priorities and spirit of the Lord of life? For you and me today, you know, we're not living with the pressure, pressure of trade guilds and the church in Thyatira. We're not living in the era of Bonhoeffer and the pressure of a fascist regime. But we have our own pressures. We have our own lovers on the side that we need to deal with. We have our own things that are tearing away from our allegiance. So for you and me today, the questions remain the same, and we have to ask them, and we have to wrestle with them. So as we come to a close today, (laughs) we find that maybe this message was less in the genre of after-school family sitcom and more in the genre of, of sweeping love story that Jesus loves us so much. He wants us all to himself. And he will call us out when we begin to walk down the path 
of straying in our allegiance to him, in dabbling in other things over here on the side and effectively cheating on him. But I'd like us to turn a corner and end on a more uplifting note and end uh, by looking at the promises of God for us, for those who follow what he's asking and, and take heed of his warning and turn away from these areas. There's a couple interesting ones here. There's actually a promise to the ones who stay the course and don't follow Jezebel. Jesus recognizes there are some in Thyatira who have not gone down her road. They have remained true and they remain the course. And that's going to be true in any church. There's going to be people who are struggling. And there's going to be people who have sorted out a long time ago and are staying in the course now. And I love what he says to those people. He says, I add nothing more to you. I have nothing for you. I had nothing more to you. Simply stay the course. Keep on keeping on. It reminds me of his words in the Gospel of Matthew that my, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You've figured it out. You're holding fast to me. You're increasing all the right things. You have not been led astray by the false prophetess. Keep on keeping on. Just simply follow me. I'm not going to add anything else to you. Church, when we figure it out, and we learn how to just simply follow Jesus and stop playing around with other things, life just goes better. The burdens and the yokes fall off, and we can just simply keep on keeping on towards the rewards and the promises that he has for us. And that leads us to the, the section that every letter closes with, to the one who is victorious. And in this one, he, he says two things. I'll give authority over the nations, and I'll give the morning star. And we go, what now? What do those things mean? Well, authority over the nations, we've actually covered that before in, in, in different language in one of the other letters. It speaks to the fact that we will rule and reign with Jesus. And I love that image with this letter in particular because this letter that speaks so clearly of the danger and the trap of sin and compromise, that when we are victorious over that, the things that so quickly enslave us now allow us and now we move in victory to be granted the authority to rule. We can move from slave to king. When we find ourselves victorious over sin and compromise, we move from slave to king. What a promise. But wait, there is another one here, and it's the promise of the morning star, which is really needs to be understood within the greater context of Revelation because Jesus refers to himself as the bright and morning star in the book of Revelation. He is the morning star. He offers himself as the reward for being victorious. And he does so with this most striking image. And in offering himself as the morning star, it's almost a pre-reward. The morning star in nature usually appears when night is at its coldest and darkest. When there is no sign of dawn, that is when the morning star appears. And though it may be small and faint at first, it heralds the fact that light is coming and dark will pass away. And saying... I will give you the morning star. Jesus is communicating a special encouragement to those who are willing and able to remain loyal and true to him. He's saying, keep your eyes on me. Fix your eyes on me. The struggle is almost over. Dawn is coming. The light is here. You're not in this alone. Whatever, whatever area you've been dabbling in, whatever compromise you've fallen victim to, whatever struggle you are facing, just keep your eyes on me. It's almost over. Dawn is coming. The light is here. What an incredible promise. And as always, whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit is speaking. Let's pray, and then we're going to take communion together to close today. So God, thank you for your word, and I want to start with this. If there's anyone watching today who has not made a decision yet for Jesus, we want to give you that opportunity. So if you're watching, if you're listening, and you are just feeling the Spirit impress on you and need to lay down whatever you're holding and to just take hold of Jesus and accept him for who he is and follow in his ways, would you just pray this along with me? Jesus, I recognize my need for you. I acknowledge that you died on the cross for my sins, that you rose again in victory so I can walk in, in all the newness of life that you've promised for me. Jesus, today I, I open my life to you. May your love and may your grace and your mercy come flooding in. And I commit to walking in all the ways you have for me. Amen. If that's you, please let someone know. We want to celebrate with you. We want to make sure to get a Bible in your hands, get you connected to what's happening at our church. We want to celebrate that decision that you made. Now, we're just going to keep praying for a few more things. So just continue to just um, close.
close your eyes and bow your heads along with me. Jesus, we've covered some pretty heavy stuff today. And God, I pray for those who are feeling the conviction of your spirit today in whatever area. God, I just pray that some of these things we've built up that are not of you begin to fall away. God, I pray that if we've been, if we've been holding on to a spirit of tolerance, God, may that break. May we recognize what a low bar tolerance is. May we aspire to the higher standard you've set for us. God, if we've been um, holding on to a spirit of compromise, God, would you help us today to plant that flag in the ground and to say, no longer will I try to live both. Today, I choose you, Jesus. Today, I walk away from these other things that I've been compromising with, and I choose to embrace you fully. For those today who may, the, the image of cheating on Jesus is his resonating so deeply, and they're going, I, I've just, I've looked you in the face, Jesus, and confessed my love for you, but I've, I haven't been doing it with my actions. I've been cheating on you behind your back. God, I pray that they would not feel beat up. I pray there would not be guilt. I pray there would not be shame. I pray there would just be a turning away from what they've been doing and a running towards your arms. That they would feel your warm embrace and that in that embrace they would find all they need and have no desire or temptation to fall back to the other things that they were giving themselves to. God, I pray for freedom in the name of Jesus. I pray for a release of chains, a release of bondage, a release of enslavement in the name of Jesus. And I pray that as a church, um, we would walk fully in all that you have for us. As I mentioned, my fear is that this, this um, archetype that we see in Thyatira is such an easy one to slip into. That we can get so consumed with, oh, we're increasing in so many good things, but we're just going to let these things over here just keep happening. We're going to tolerate them. We're going to allow a little bit of compromise. It's no big deal. God, I pray that we would break that mindset in the name of Jesus. I pray that that mindset would have no foothold in our church here. I pray that it would have no foothold in our hearts and minds as followers of Jesus. I pray that we would embrace you fully as our Lord, as our Savior, as the lover of our souls, and that we would not stray. We would not be tempted. We would not add other lovers. We would be fully satisfied with who you are, Jesus. Thank you and praise you for all that you do for us and all that you are in your name. Amen. And so with that, church, we do come to the table of communion. And I think it's a fitting way to end today as we talk about allegiance, we talk about faithfulness. You know, taking communion reminds us of what Christ did for us in a very real way. It allows us to, to recommit ourselves, to reaffirm our allegiance, our faithfulness to him. And for any of us today who are struggling, for any of us today who, who have felt the convicting poke of the Spirit and are, are just feeling maybe a little bit down, a little bit beat up in our own minds by what we've, we've been allowing to happen in our lives, the table communion reminds us of His mercy, of His grace, of His forgiveness, of His love, that no matter what was happening in your life when you started this message, you can now come to the table and just lay it all down and receive his forgiveness. As, you, as we eat of the bread together and drink of the cup together, we're reminded of his body broken for us, his blood poured out for us, and that there is hope, and that there is forgiveness, and that there is new life in him. So we do read in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul writes, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also we took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant of my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So church today, wherever you are, I hope you have the elements ready. If not, it's totally okay to just pause the video and grab them and come back and play it. Uh, but we're going to take a moment here. We're going to remember what Christ did for us. We're going to thank him and praise him for that. We're going to reaffirm our our faith in him, our allegiance to him. And we're going to recognize in this moment there is grace and there is mercy and there is forgiveness no matter what you have done. So would you please take the bread? Would you break it with me? And let's be thankful and grateful for his body broken for us.
and then take the cup. The symbol of his blood poured out for us. As we drink, let's thank him and praise him for his love poured out, his grace poured out, his mercy poured out. That what he did on the cross covers us and invites us into a new relationship with him. Let's drink together. Jesus, we thank you for the cross. We thank you for the price that you paid once for all. One sacrifice for every single person, whoever has lived, whoever is living, and whoever will live. God, we thank you that there is nothing that we can do. It's all about what you've done for us. So today we once again remember the price that was paid. We are grateful for it. We are thankful for it. We praise you for it. And we commit ourselves to you. We pledge our allegiance to you, Jesus. And we ask for your forgiveness to wash over us. And you give us the strength to continue to walk in all the ways you've called us to. In your name. Amen. And that is our service for today, church. Thank you once again for joining with us. Just want to reaffirm once again how much we love you all, how much we care for you all. Please let us know if there's anything we can be praying for for you. If there's any information that you need, please call the church office. We'd love to make sure that you are uh, up to date on what's going on and know how to get connected, know how to be involved in what's happening. Uh, until next time, God bless. We love you. <laughs>